Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is the uh, study session of the Mission Springs Water District on October 14th, 2021. I will call this meeting to order. Roll call, please. Director Sewell. Here. Director Grasha. Here. Director Duncan. I see you. Vice President Martin. I thought he was the one. Here. <laughs> and President Wright. Here. Thank you. We have quorum. Thank you. Rules of procedure, Mr. Pinckney. Yes. According to the rules of procedure adopted by the board, uh, all notice meetings are conducted using Rosenberg's rules of order as a procedural guideline. The president is responsible for maintenance of order and decorum at all board meetings. No person should be allowed to speak who has not first been recognized by the president. No member of the board should speak more than once upon any one subject until every other member of the board wishing to speak on the subject shall have been given an opportunity to speak. No board member shall interfere with the orderly progress of the board meeting. The board, the board president regulates the amount of time to be dedicated to a particular agenda item. Thank you. Dory, do we have anybody for the public input part of this meeting? Um, let me check. George R.A., are you here to observe or would you like to make public comment today? I'm just here to observe. Thank you. Ashley, are you here just observing? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. No public comment. Thank you. Okay, item number six, COVID-19 update. Uh, would that be you, Brian? No, I'm going to. Oh, I'll, I'll I, oh there you are. Okay. <laughs> I didn't right. see you. Okay. Um, but, and... Um, Hello from, from Seattle. Um, <laughs> let me begin by saying that, you know, uh, we're not, and I won't let up until it's safe to do so, you know, as the positivity and case rates across the state continue to improve, I would like to remind everyone to continue to be vigilant in their or our efforts <clears throat> to stop the spread of COVID-19. Everyone is hopeful that we are at the beginning of the end uh, of this pandemic, but this this may linger on at least until the beginning of next year. Um, the numbers at Eisenhower are down substantially. I think Tina said at one point they only had four COVID patients um, in ICU. So they're they're very encouraging. I was talking to uh, the doctor that works with uh, Tina uh, in ICU, and he was very very positive about he, you know, the, the the pandemic going in a very positive directly uh, direction. However, with that said, safety starts with each of us at an individual level, and this includes simple habits like wearing your mask over your mouth and nose indoors, and I do it outdoors. Social distancing, washing your hands frequently, uh, and staying at home when feeling you're ill. Uh, you know, just taking precautions that you normally wouldn't. I am constantly preaching this message to my staff and even my friends, and probably the board members are going to tell you that I do it with them too. Um, and then, of course, there's OSHA, who is, I think, a little bit late in their arrival with this pandemic, but they'll probably be around long after. Uh, and as usual, they are, they have restrictions in place um, and requirements. And we are asking all employees to complete a COVID-19 self-assessment as a result of that. And we had, we asked them to do that at the start of each workday. And um, we anticipate continuing this practice at least throughout the remainder of the year. We're hearing that that, that OSHA plans to keep that requirement uh, in place. Uh, while we do not have a requirement for employee vaccination, all employees that are unvaccinated will continue to be to be required to wear a mask when indoors. And we will continue to practice social distancing. More than 70% of Californians are now fully vaccinated. That is a good, a good percentage. And I strongly and constantly encourage everyone who is not yet vaccinated to do so as soon as possible. Uh, the district remains committed to our promise of providing safe, reliable water. Um, we are equally committed to protecting the health and safety of our employees and the community. And um, 
We understand the importance of helping our customers through this crisis. Uh, following the governor's guidance, the, the uh, MSWD lobby was temporarily closed to public. We have, however, made provisions for customers now to meet with staff by appointment, and that seems to be working quite well. We don't have any complaints. Um, we anticipate, well, we have, we may have some minor ones, but, but for the most part, we have, we have heard very, very little. We anticipate the lobby closure will remain in effect until we have adequate space. As you know, we are uh, very limited with our, our space uh, and with this building. And uh, we need to do that in order to, to accomplish this, the, this, the distance uh, that we need to with both staff and customers at the payment center. Uh, to alleviate the financial burden on our customers, we have expanded payment options and programs. You're gonna hear about a, a new one too that's, that's we're excited about today. And have suspended service disconnections through the remainder of this year as the state has extended the, the moratoriums on shutoffs. And, but that will, however, continue to exacerbate our arrearage. Now, we have been very vigilant and I must compliment Arturo on this as well as Brian um, in, the, in their efforts to procure COVID relief. Um, we will submit additional requests this month However, um, recently the Water Board has uh, uh, adopted a program or adopted program guidelines that, will, that we will follow. Uh, they have also said that we are getting 100% of our request and we will continue to uh, pursue every funding opportunity we know of. And we have, we have gotten wind of a couple others. So from, that, from the financial perspective, we are gonna come out okay. Uh, as we will discuss on Monday, we will continue to hold our board meetings online and we will remain committed to ensuring these meetings are open and accessible to the public in a way that allows thoughtful public participation. Um, and I remain, I want to conclude by saying I remain proud of the district's response to the COVID-19 <clears throat> pandemic and uh, the extraordinary efforts of our employees to ensure the safe delivery of water and wastewater treatment in our community. We are essential, uh, uh, we are an essential business and these employees are truly our, our heroes in providing this service. And that's all I have, Nancy, thank you. Thank you. Um, any, oh, I guess I have a question. Okay, item number seven, human resources report. Do we've got some, uh... <laughs> anniversary oh, here yes usually we do that on monday yeah i'm just mentioning them right now yeah, we'll Danny, probably, danny's 24 years he's the longest one and he won't time. be here so we'll probably bring him up again um later um you know that's a lot of years to be with the district yeah i keep looking over there looking for Arden. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I was last last. Month. yeah. Okay, number eight. What we were doing on Monday. So we'll yes. go on. To, that right? gives us. Okay, so we will go on to number nine. First amendment to contract amendment with uh, pay near me. Yes, I, I, Brian will uh, will pick up. Uh, but I want to just say to introduce this is that we're about to substantially uh, improve make some more improvements to our customer service. As you know, we, we use every year we do something. Well, I think we're gonna do some very substantial changes uh, and, and that'll start happening here now. Um, pay, now uh, pay Near Me, excuse me, has expanded their service and we have found that they, they, that, that service will provide us with substantial benefits. So we're, we're looking forward to uh, to uh, uh, you know, authorizing you the uh, potentially your authorization to execute this First Amendment. Brian, do you want to give them some specifics with this? Thank you, General Manager, uh, Madam President, members of the board. The item you have in front of you for discussion is a pay near me amendment to an existing contract. The existing contract dates back to 2013. It's a payment processing agreement. Uh, Pay Near Me provides water and sewer utility customers various payment methods. Uh, 
uh, using their web-based technology service. They promote payments by various conveniently located brick and mortar establishments. That's what drew us to this particular uh, vendor. Uh, we use them specifically for the 7-Eleven here locally. Uh, since 2013, they've expanded their service to include other vendors such as Walmart, for example. Our customers can go into Walmart and pay their bill as well. This particular agreement you have in front of you will allow us to have even more options using Apple Pay, Google Pay, quick response or QR codes, which will be placed on everyone's bill so they can simply scan it with their phone and they will get back a, a, a payment voucher, if you will, which they will pay and then send it right back. So they'll be able to do it by themselves on their phone using this pay near me service. Uh, in addition to having more options, it also will reduce our cost by almost 60,000 per year. Hmm. Any additional questions? <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Uh, Steve, did you have a question? I almost forgot. President Wright, please use your mic. Oh, thank you. Uh, Director Grasha, I didn't look up to see if either one of you uh, or Randy were, were you guys. It's okay. Okay. Anything I, else? I j just uh, wondering. Um, Walmart's a good uh, upgrade. Uh, what? Uh, uh, tell me what. Uh, there's a, a percentage of the uh, bill, I guess, that's charged that they collect for their fee. What? Uh, how, how does that work? And do you, do you know offhand what the uh, how, what's the percentage that they take for that service? I, I can talk in relative terms. Uh, one of the vendors we currently use charges roughly three dollars per transaction. Pay near me is two dollars per transaction. So that's really where you see the savings. We do anywhere from. Um, 60,000 transactions, depending on how you pay your bill, that would be able to use this program as much as almost 98,000 per year. That's where we got that $60,000 savings. It's basically the number of transactions, the dollar that we're saving by using this vendor is how we came up with that $60,000 savings. So it, it's, the, it's what we pay to process that. Now there are others you bring up 7-Eleven uh, and Walmart, that particular, they do actually, when they pay cash at those locations, they do pay it up front. The customer does, but in most of our, I believe I calculate to be almost 80% of our, of our transactions, we actually pay for in the back end. And um, how many of our customers are paying this way as opposed to uh, people that just pay by check or credit card? Uh, I think you mentioned the number and sounded you say 80,000 transactions a year? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, currently, we've actually pulled the numbers with the help of Arturo, our finance director. To date, we've actually processed over 100,000 transactions. Of those, less than 1%, roughly 130 per month are cash. We have a variety of different ways we can do it by check. Some of it is actually the paper check, which is about 15% per month. We have about 13 where, where you contact your bank and you simply pay through an H, uh, ACH uh, automatic clearinghouse method as well. Uh, IVR, when people call in, is about 9%. Online through engineering and other fees and things like that is about 3% of our transactions. Pay near me currently is less than 1%. Obviously, this contract will change that amount. Another HCH, a safe pay method is about 7%. And then the most popular method of payment is people log into our website once a month, go through that process, 21%, roughly 3,000 customers a month pay using our website. And, and how many uh, are standing out in front of the building pounding on the glass every month? Trying, trying to, I, I mean, have, have, is that number uh, been minimized? Uh, I guess, it, I'm, I'm, who, who's being missed, if you will? We, we do have a handful of customers that do come to the building. They either put their cash in the drop box or they don't feel comfortable dropping their money off in the drop box and they'll knock on their door. We do have a process cameras in place where we can see or hear them. And then we'll open the door uh, once we realize that it's a customer and not someone trying to break in or do something uh, yeah. outrageous. It's, it's just a handful. Right. And the estimate would be anywhere between five and maybe 15 a month. And, and is it in your opinion that most people that are paying all these different methods um, 
uh, my hope is that we're, 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 we're not missing people and that people are aggravated. People that use the website, they're comfortable with that form of payment. People that go to Walmart are, are comfortable with that because they're paying other bills that way and they're used to it. Uh, you know, the 7-Eleven store just sounds like a terrorizing kind of, uh, I'm just hoping that uh, we're, we're not making enemies out there. So just if you can keep an eye for that. We will, Director, and as we start to roll out our web portal and our other payment options, our communications and outreach folks will actually be asking those types of questions to get that kind of feedback. The other item that we're not mentioning, because these this, this information is, is relatively fresh in this calendar year, we're also missing, including some of the people that may be paying by cash, some of the people aren't paying because they don't have to or not choose not to because of the COVID-19. So these numbers are, are somewhat uh, misleading because we do know we have a good portion or good percentage that are not paying their bill. And that may be the cash related uh, people that you're talking about. Yeah, I haven't heard any complaints. I'm just thinking in terms of my own uh, experiences throughout my life, you know, when things are going good, it's a, it no, not a problem at all. And when things start to crunch, it gets a little more desperate. I think for a lot of people, they're probably feeling that. And uh, I just hope that when we get to the point where we start closing in on them for their back payments that we have a way for them to conveniently do that without, you know, having to be in the same room with them, if you will, I guess. I don't I, Thank you anyway. Okay. Sounds like you're on top of it. I think we've yes, got the I mean, options for everybody out there to pay their bill. Okay. Item number 10, acceptance of grant of easement deed for public water utilities, Desert Willows Property Owners Association. Mr. Wallen. Um, again, I'll have, uh, yes, I'll have, uh, I'll have Brian uh, help me with this one. Uh, he's, uh, this is, this, this has been done and pretty much what it, you see on the uh, uh, staff report is exactly what happened. We, as we go through these things, we, we see that we, you know, may or may not have some of the paperwork followed up on and that's, and even if, we would have had easements in this place. We 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 put the water line in a different location, so we would have probably had to have a new easement anyway. But Brian, you want to go ahead and give them a background here? Absolutely. Thank you, General Manager. Again, Madam President, members of the board, uh, the item you have in front of you is accepting a utility easement for our new water main and other utilities, including backflows and things like that, water meters and things of that nature. We did recently go through uh, Desert Willows and put in a brand new water line and services and things of that nature. Uh, we have been maintaining the water line there since uh, 18, excuse me, 1984. And what, as as our general manager alluded to, as we were going through the process of making sure that we were staying in the existing easements and roadways and things of that nature, we realized that it uh, was unclear if that easement had been recorded or if we even had an easement. So we just asked the uh, Property Goers Association community, hey, can you give us an easement? And that's exactly what they did. They granted this particular item. Uh, one thing of note, even though we, we, even though we do own and maintain the water, we do not own and maintain the sanitary sewer. So this is just a water only easement. Um, this will not be the only time you see this particular item or at least Desert Willows. I believe next month we'll be bringing you the notice of completion, which will finalize the construction project. With That's Van Dyke, yes. Great, um, questions? No. Director Duncan, Director Grasha. Uh, Director Grasha. Yeah, I, I thought Randy was going to go. Um, the, this is only for water. Uh, the sewer lines run, I guess, quite a few feet away from each other. The water and sewer, 25 feet. So this allows us to go in to do work if we need to. And, and, and we didn't have this before. Or what's what? Tell me, how did I miss that? Did I? Uh, one, it's not that we didn't have it or didn't have ability to go in and maintain our water mains. It's just we didn't have a, the formal easement or we couldn't find that when we were doing the development. So we decided that after we did the design plans that we would make sure to get that as part of this process. This is just that recording of that easement. Okay. Thank you. There's never been a problem with, with Desert Willows. They've always, you know, in fact, I think they assumed that there was an easement too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, item number 11, award of contract for the Regional Water Reclamation Facility Project and Capital Budget Augmentation. Okay, this one's gonna, we, we, we have a good presentation for you today. Um, this one is getting me excited. Um, and Steve will um, uh, make the presentation and then Brian will, and, and probably Arturo will, um, will be there for uh, the presentation also. Um, we've been putting this together, like I said, for uh, over a decade. We've had dozens of, uh, of uh, board meetings where we've discussed it in public. You, we put, you know, at every step, including preparing ourselves financially for this, have we brought the board in? Um, and in every aspect that we assumed in our strategic financial planning, we are in a better condition today than what we assumed in that planning process. So we could not be in a better position to build this plant right now than we are. Uh, we are expanding our service area, resulting in additional revenue. Uh, lastly, uh, we have been so successful with our groundwater protection program, mainly the, of course, the septic to sewers that, you know, the, that we are basically at capacity at Horton. We, we have to do something now. And, um, and this is an, an option that we were fortunate enough to be able to put together. And like I said before, our position is much better than we expected. Uh, and we couldn't, we couldn't have been in a better position at this juncture. So with that, Steve, do you wanna make your, your uh, presentation? Uh, sure, well, thank you, General Manager Wallum. Uh, good afternoon, Madam President and board members. Um, I have a short presentation today, just walking through the history of the regional regional water reclamation facility, uh, what the plant looks like today, where the bids came in at, and what the funding outlook is. So bear with me while I share my screen. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So a little bit of background on the program. Uh, it, the regional water reclamation facility was originally envisioned in the 2006 water master plan. It identified a regional plant that would ultimately serve up to 20 million gallons per day. Um, then a couple of years later, the district produced a comprehensive wastewater facility strategic plan, which identified what the first phase of that regional plant would look like based on development at that time. Shortly after that comprehensive strategic plan was completed, um, you know, the market went south and we were in the economic recession for several years, which delayed any, any progress on the project. Um, as we got into kind of the mid 2010s, uh, we knew that we had, we were continuing to increase capacity or our available capacity at Horton. Um, so we either needed to decide to expand the Horton wastewater treatment plant or build the new regional plant. Um, so we began preliminary uh, scoping for the project around 2013 through 2015, uh, and ultimately the board elected to go in the direction of the new regional wastewater treatment plant. Um, AECOM was retained in 2017 to provide design services. Uh, we went through a preliminary design process first, um, in which we identified the, a sequence batch reactor process as the most viable option. Um, it's a lower cost alternative and it would be readily uh, uh, upgraded to a membrane bioreactor technology in the future. Um, and that's the key there is that we were really focused on going to MBR treatment process in the future. It provides a much higher water quality, effluent water quality uh, for recycled water purposes. And that's really the next step that we're gonna be headed with at the regional plant. Um, in addition, we firmed up the capacity for the new plant at one and a half million gallons per day. Uh, we brought the preliminary design back to the board in, I think it was November of 2018, and the board approved moving forward with the final design at that time. As we worked through the final design, um, you know, additional details emerged, but at the end of the day, we ultimately settled or stayed on a sequence batch reactor treatment pr uh, process with one and a half million gallon capacity. Uh, the plant site includes an operations and administrative building using common wall construction prefabricated building to save costs, and it includes on-site on disposal and percolation ponds at the south end of the site. 
Um, I have a couple of graphics coming up to show you what that looks like uh, on the next slide. Um, the wastewater treatment capacity planning, um, initially when the plant first comes online, the regional plant will be diverting about 200,000 gallons per day away from the Horton wastewater treatment plant. That will be part of the seed flow that seeds the plant during startup. Um, in addition, we'll need some sort of future diversion, whether it's for an interceptor sewer on Little Morongo or an additional diversion out of the Horton plant. But as long as we, uh, or excuse me, we plan for some future diversion of existing flows to the regional plant to ensure that Horton has a much longer service life than what it's currently at. So immediately we'll only have a little bit of relief, but we have options to provide additional relief from Horton to extend its service life at its existing capacity. Um, what we've identified is that we easily be able to treat up to our, our extend up to 10 years at Horton by diverting just the roughly 0.5 MGD um, from that plant and putting it down towards the regional plants. Um, this is a layout of the site. The district owns, or at least between uh, 20th Avenue and 19th Avenue, the district owns about 60 acres of property. Um, north is to the right of your screen. And you see the main site here with two entrances. Uh, you know, cars can come in here. This is our main administrative building and kind of the plant processes tucked around it. It's a very small footprint, also aiding in reduction of costs. There is a road going down, an access road going down to where the influent disposal ponds would be. Um, you can see that there's space left down here at the south end of the site for future expansion on the effluent disposal ponds, as well as plenty of space um, to the west and to the south of the site, and not shown but to the north for any future expansions, ultimately getting to that 20 MD, MGD capacity. Uh, the plant layout, again, north is to um, the right of your screen. Um, coming in from Little Morongo to the bottom of your screen, flows come in to an influent pump station with three influent pumps. It goes through a bar screen and metering facility and then through a grit removal chamber. That takes away any of the trash, rags, or grit that may be in the water before it gets to the treatment process. It then comes in and goes into one of these four sequence batch reactor tanks. Uh, what's unique about the sequence batch reactor is that it does your preliminary treatment, your aeration, and your clarification all in one tank. Um, again, that's a much smaller footprint, and that provides the ability to convert to MBR in the future. Uh, from there, the flows go to uh, this effluent distribution channel, a little hard to see, but they go directly from there in gravity down to the disposal ponds at the south end of the site. Um, the proposed maintenance and operations building is shown here kind of in this bold outline. Um, closest to the treatment process is the dewatering room. Right now it will be equipped with one belt filter press. It has the ability for a, the, uh, the loadout truck to be backed into the facility and put those solids directly into the truck. There are provisions in the building for the future expansion for a second dewatering uh, piece of equipment that will be needed when we do the next expansion. Um, I do want to note that we did include the uh, request, the exact same model belt filter press that we currently have at the Horton plant. Um, that has been a very uh, reliable unit and operation staff will be able to share parts, spare parts between the two facilities to cut down on the need for spare parts on the shelf. Um, next, we'll have a chlorine room, a maintenance garage, and then the operations building, which has kind of a, a conference room and lounge area. It includes a couple offices, an operations room, and a laboratory, uh, as well as restroom facilities and a storage closet. Um, the next kind of square rectangle you see here is the electrical room. And south of that is the blower room, which provides all the air for the aeration uh, process. Uh, any questions on the plant layout so far? I have one. Uh, yes. Um, you mentioned laboratories. Does this include showers? Yes, there is a shower in both the men's and women's restroom. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Where are what you? Uh, Go ahead. Okay, thank you. What, um, what limits this plant as it's designed to one and a half million gallons? Is it any particular piece of equipment or if you were to double it, would you have to? What would you have to double to, to get to? For instance, uh, to Director Grasha, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up. 
the plant is designed to convert to a 3 million gallon membrane bioreactor facility without throwing away anything that you see in front of you. Uh, meaning that the influent pump station, it's the wet well is sized to accommodate 3 million gallons. There's an extra influent channel right where my cursor is at to accommodate that flow. There's an extra grit removal chamber. And then these tanks, these sequence batch reactor tanks are sized to accommodate 3 million gallons um, at full capacity. So we wouldn't be operating to the full depth that they can be used during initial operations. Um, but they were all designed that way. So basically in the future, we can add filters right here on the south side of these tanks and we'd be at 3 million gallon capacity. Um, as I noted, we'd have the room for future dewatering for a belt filter place, or excuse me, a second belt filter press to accommodate that additional capacity. And there's room and uh, additional space inside the blower and electrical room to accommodate a full 3 million gallon plant. And, and to take it from three to five million gallons, uh, you just, uh, what happens there? How, what, what's the projected life at say three million gallons a day uh, in terms of the years before the population? Because uh, we've, we've got some pretty good numbers as far as the population growth, it looks like. Uh, is it going to be 20 years before we go to 3 million or, or are we looking at 3 million in five years? And then d d have you been able to figure that out at all? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, change screens. Based on the planning assumptions, uh, this plant will at one and a half million gallons will have a service life of e easily 10 to 15 years. Um, that's that planning, those planning numbers were derived from the assumption that we would complete the rest of our groundwater quality protection program over the next decade. And that's really where all the additional flows are going to come that are really going to take up the capacity at this plant. Okay. Now, uh, back at about your first slide, you talked about um, things that uh, basically had up your sleeve, should we need to have more capacity at Horton? Um, it sounded like you were uh, um, talking about a, a, the a need for an additional pipeline from Horton down to, uh, I guess, I'm, I'm, assu I'm assuming this, so maybe you can fill me in what, what, what it is you were talking about to, to get Horton um, to move along a little uh, more in terms of uh, its useful life. So uh, again, Director Grosh, a great question. The district has options when it comes to that. There is an existing force main that takes flows from the Dos Palmas lift station up to Horton, and those flows are gonna be rerouted to the regional plant. So that pipeline exists, and we've already run the calculations that with a little bit of work with just connecting that force main to the headworks area or one of the influent manholes at the Horton plant, we could divert flows and gravity them down to the Dos Palmas lift station and send those flows over to the regional plant if needed. So depending on where capacities go as we go forward, where development occurs, where we continue to complete groundwater quality protection projects, we can either do that or have the option to build an interceptor sewer somewhere else um, in the district service area to bring flows down to the regional plants. Directly down like Little Morongo. Yeah, for example. Uh, basically from two, two Bunch and Little Morongo down to Dillon and Little Morongo. If we built that interceptor line, we would be able to, to divert additional flows. And what we've projected, that would put Horton out of roughly 15, 20 years before we would need to uh, contemplate another expansion there. And uh, at what point would you be able to, uh, at Horton, one of my concerns there is that the, the height of those ponds that were installed at the rear of those homes there, um, that needs to be mitigated in some in some way, and um, whether it's uh, acquiring more land and moving them or, or or what, I don't know. But they shouldn't have to deal with that. And um, uh, are they at that height for flood control reasons, or uh, in in case of a flood, or are they that height because we needed them that high to get over the hump? Okay, we're we're off subject. No, we're not. Go back to no, the regional plan. We're not off subject, man. 
Well, we're talking, you're talking about berms at the Horton plant, and we're talking about the regional plant. We're right? talking about a contract. We're talking about contract. Uh, we're talking about billion contract. dollars uh, to build something that uh, is it going to take care of other issues? And if you can't talk about all the other issues, then what's the point of? We're talking about feeding? the contract right now. The other issues you can. I, I know. I'm sorry, but we're talking about the contract. Thank you. Um, anything else, Mr. Grasha? No, I've decided on how I'm going to vote. Thank you. Okay. Um, go ahead, Steve. Uh, oh, I had one Ivan question. Wants uh, Steve, the one previous slide before this, um, just to get a kind of reference, are these infiltration ponds about the same size as those at the Horton? Uh, these, uh, thank you, Director Sewell. These ponds are bigger than the ones at Horton, but they're only anticipated to, I think, an operational depth of two feet. Uh, so they're about five feet deep, five, six feet deep, but the operational range again is only about two feet of water in those ponds. Okay. And then how close is the main site there um, to our solar field to the north? Is that pretty close? Um, I would, uh, I'm guessing here, but it's probably two, 300 yards. Okay. Thank you. Not a little bit more. Um, this is the main site's kind of right in the middle between 19th and 20th, if, if you can picture that. Okay, thank you. Director Duncan, question, comment? No, no. Nope. Nope, okay, thanks. thank you. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Ledbecker. Okay, only a couple more slides. Just wanna talk about the bidding process itself and then what the funding outlook looked, uh, looks like. So on the bidding, we began our bidding on May 18th and did bid opening on July 22nd. Um, three weeks after the bid opening, we had a pre-bid conference, a mandatory pre-bid conference for all post contractors to come out, uh, hear about the project, ask questions, and actually go out to the project site to get, up, get familiar with the constraints. Um, upon bid opening, we received five bids, and the bids ranged from $40.9 million up to $50.8 million. Um, the bids did come in higher than what we expected from the engineer's estimate. AECOM had prepared an engineer's estimate going into bidding around $34 million. So we were a little bit surprised that there was about a 22% increase uh, in the actual bid amount. Um, I will note during that time, the engineer's estimate was done at the beginning of the year, and there had been quite a bit of transitory inflation and other impacts to supply chains by the time chains, excuse me, before we did our bid opening on July. Um, there's additional details on that in your bid packet. Um, what we found is that JF Shea Construction was identified as the lowest responsive bidder. They have 24 years experience in the construction of water and wastewater infrastructure. They have a total bonding capacity of 750 million. Um, in addition, their largest wastewater treatment plant completed was close to $200 million for the Orange County Sanitation District. Um, their proposed project manager has been with the firm for over 20 years and has managed projects as large as 570 million. Um, in addition, their site superintendent has also been with the firm for or the uh, company for close to 20 years. Um, so they put a very strong team together. We've called references. We've verified and reviewed their bidding documents, um, and everything checks out. So they are they are being recommended for award for construction. I want to spend a few minutes talking about funding, um, just to try to uh, get ahead of any questions that may be coming. So as you know, we've been working with the State Water Resource Control Board through their Clean Water SRF process for a little over two years. Uh, we submitted our original application back in June of 2019, and it wasn't until February of 2021 that they deemed our application as complete and kind of uh, quasi-approved it. Uh, from that step forward, we've been working through legal, consulta legal consultations, financial consultations, as well as determining what the final amount of the SRF and grant portions of the project would be. Um, as of October 1st, we've received our construction eligibility date. So while we don't have a final agreement in hand today, we've been notified by the state that any costs associated with the construction of the treatment plant are available for reimbursement once the final grant agreement is complete. Um, and I just wanna stress that, that that's really critical for us coming in to ask you for a ward of construction that we, all, we, we will be spending out of pocket for the next couple months until the final agreement is complete, but all those costs are 100% reimbursable. Um, the final funding agreement is expected in the next uh, around November, December, and we'll be bringing that to you for approval. 
And then from there, it goes back to the state for their final execution, which would be expected in January of this year. Um, that timeline has slipped a little bit and it's for good reason, which I'm gonna get into next. So the recommended funding, it's changed quite a bit. We were, we were originally slated to receive up to 8 million in small community wastewater grant funding and up to 8 million in groundwater grant funding. Um, but back in August, uh, the state of uh, approved through Senate Bill 129, additional infrastructure appropriations. One of the priorities of the infrastructure appropriations is septic to sewer projects and projects related to septic to sewer for residential areas. And what the state staff has been working on uh, with myself and Mission Spring staff over the last two months is identifying how much additional grant funding the district may receive from that infrastructure appropriations. So we've already been approved for $8 million from the small community wastewater and 8 million from the groundwater grant program. And staff has recommended that we receive an additional 33.1 million in grant funding uh, towards the project. Um, they are very aware of the hurdle that we've been uh, faced with, with the bid prices coming in much higher. And again, our project, while it has been uh, slowed down waiting for this funding approval, um, couldn't be in a better place at a better time uh, with this infrastructure appropriation funding coming available. We're not guaranteed a full 49.1 million in grant funding. We're still working through those details, um, but staff has already recommended and the assistant deputy director has already uh, approved up to the full amount of the SRF request in grant funding. Now, when um, he so, said staff, he means the State Water Resources Control Board staff. Yes, thank you, General Manager. Um, in addition, any costs incurred above whatever the ultimate grant amount would be, would be at a 0.9% interest rate. Um, so I have a couple uh, bar graphs to show on the next two slides that show you the two bookends on what that funding may look like. So on the low end, if we were to get nothing out of this new infrastructure appropriations, which is not being proposed, but this would be our worst case scenario, um, I'll, I'll kind of walk through. On the left, we have all the construction costs. Um, there's about 52 million in construction costs for the regional plant and um, soft costs for design, construction management, inspection, um, administration by district staff um, for the conveyance line. And again, I know we're, we're here today to talk specifically about the treatment plant, but I need to show you the full financials for the program because that's how the application to the state is written. Um, so again, the conveyance line, a construction cost of 7.8 million with uh, soft costs around a little under a million and the M2 collection system, construction costs of about 10.5 and uh, soft costs of around 1.2 million. Um, and how that would pair up with the funding, if we were to only get 16 million in funding, we would be looking at 8 million from the small community wastewater grant, um, 8 million from the groundwater grant program, about 4.2 million from uh, district contributions, and about 48 million in SRF. At 0.9%. Yes, at 0.9%. percent Yes, can't forget that part. Um, and I do, I do need to show you the other, the other, the other bookend, uh, as I like to refer to it. So nothing changes with the construction costs, but you can see here we would be receiving uh, the same eight million in small community grant funding, the same uh, eight million in groundwater grant funding, and then up to thirty-three point one million in the inf uh, uh, infrastructure appropriations funding. Um, the same amount of four point two million for district funding, and that would bring the SRF down to about fifteen point. $2 million. So those are really the two bookends that we're dealing with from a funding scenario. We've been told we're, you know, staff's again recommending the full amount. We don't know if that will ultimately shake out, but we know we will be getting more than $16 million in grant towards the project. Um, we have reviewed the numbers uh, with accounting. Um, and last, it, within the last year, staff had already reported that the district had up to $16, uh, $16 million in debt capacity. Uh, so in either scenario, the district has the availability to pay off the debt, whether it be the uh, 15.1 million SRF in the uh, high end scenario or in the low end scenario, the 48 million. In addition, that $60 million in debt capacity the district has, um, it's actually uh, would be higher based on the interest rate proposed by the state. So since we have a 0.9% interest rate, we would actually be stretching that 60 million quite a bit further. Um, so we're well below the district's capacity to take on debt 
at this time. Um, one thing also to note is that by the State Water Resource Control Board, uh, or as part of this process, we had to go through a full financial evaluation, give them the last five years of our audited financial statements. It was a very long process and they've ultimately evaluated and confirmed that Mission Springs uh, financials are approved and you know, we have the capacity to pay back the loan with the state. Um, and that takes us to the board action. This is directly from your staff report, but to authorize the general manager to award a contract for the construction of the regional water reclamation facility project to JF Shea Construction, the lowest responsible bidder in the amount of 40 million nine hundred eighty six thousand plus a five percent contingency of two million forty nine thousand three hundred for a total of forty three million thirty five thousand three hundred and augment the capital improvement budget to uh, amount, excuse me, to $51.2 million for job number 11424 and do all things necessary to complete the project. Um, any questions? Uh, I might just add that, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things about this that, that you know, we, we factored into here. One is, I mean, getting back to the, the capacity of, this allows us to operate at Horton, uh, you know, at, at full capacity and gives us a little more flexibility. If something happens, we have the capacity to move that to the regional plant on an emergency level. We also, this will, you know, moving on this right now, because I can tell you that this funding um, level of 0.9% is going to go up next year. Every, every financial prediction there is out there is telling us that that is that that interest rate is going to go up. So, it, you know, we couldn't be building this at a better time in order to capture the lowest interest on any loan that we have to take out. Uh, we also, the thing that may not have been as clear is that we not only are getting the state funding on it, but we are getting assessment district participation. And this is all money that does not come off the rates, which will help us maintain lower rates as low as uh, at the lowest possible rates that we can. And, and so putting this all together has been, uh, I mean, one of the focuses of doing this at this point and the way we're doing it is to keep our rates as low as we possibly can. Okay, yes. that's all I have. Okay, Director Sewell has a question. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I'm excited to see the, the possibility for that additional funding. Um, but also, did uh, JF Shea, did they give any kind of construction timeline as far as if we move forward with this, what their estimated completion would be? Uh, Director Sewell, we've uh, required in the bidding documents substantial completion within 18 months. That means the plant would be operational within 18 months of receiving the notice to proceed. They may have additional tasks that to uh, after that, like completing fencing or entry, entryways or whatnot, but uh, we're focused on being operational within 18 months. And uh, if we did move forward, did they say how soon they would begin construction? Um, they don't really get to dictate that. It'd be up to the district. We have about 30 days to execute agreements uh, with JF Shea. And from there, we would start working towards uh, setting that notice to proceed date for construction. Uh, with a project of this size and scope, we do need to spend some time ahead of time processing submittals and get ahead of that. In addition, the mitigation monitoring and reporting requirements uh, from our CEQA document they require that we do our biological surveys for desert tortoise, uh, fringe toe and flat tail lizards, as well as bird surveys before we start construction. So we still have a couple months of setup work before they could even break ground on the project. Okay, thank you. Vice President Martin. No, thank you. Uh, Director Grasha. What is the uh, downside to waiting uh, a year or six months even? The downside is that the Horton wastewater treatment plant is at uh, capacity. Um, average daily flows are above 2 million gallons, and it's only permitted, uh, I believe, for 2.2 million gallons per day. Um, as, as, as you, we had a, you know, a couple uh, concerns under COVID with peak flows uh, going higher with people staying home. Um, so that is certainly a concern. Uh, that's a little bit out of the district's control with uh, flows coming into the plant. Okay. There's certainly and, ways around that, but and all this, the operations speak to that. I'm, I'm, I'll add to that partly too. Uh, my 
assessment in guest is that it would cost us millions of dollars. I'll bet it, uh, it, it might cost you millions. I don't know what your involvement is, but my question is how at, the, at this point we're not approving a connection. It just doesn't make any sense that without both items here to be approved to prove one because there's some kabuki theater going on in terms of money that might be available is just it, it it boggles my mind that this board would go down this road when you know they're, they're possibly 33 million dollars maybe if we're if we're good and we vote for this tonight we might get another you know that's just ridiculous when all we have to do is say slow down wait a minute let's uh Let's see how this plays out. And if that money becomes available, then you've got a new game. But right now you don't have a pipeline to connect the two and you don't, you don't, you, you can't afford it. You're bonding out to the point where you're, uh, you're talking about loaning to the wall to build it. And it's just bad, bad all the way around. I don't understand why you're in a hurry to do this, but that's uh, just me and who knows. Okay. Um, Director Duncan. Yeah, uh, 10 years ago when we started this dream, if you will, started this reality of building this thing, we were looking at about 20 million to build it. And we all kind of gasped that, oh my gosh, 20 million. Well, here we are 10 years later and we're, we're looking at double that. Um, on our own, I think that might be cost prohibitive or completely out of reach. But, you know, staff has been very diligent finding all this money. Some of it may have fallen in our lap. Some of it, you know, they went out to find. Um, I think staff has done a wonderful job getting all these, these grants, these very low-cost loans put together. Um, it's a great thing. I'm, I'm glad to see it getting started. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, Steve, good job uh, for, for that. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think this is uh, going along. I think we're at perfect timing, actually. And uh, and we do have uh, approval of at least 16 million plus a, a low interest loan uh, with more coming. And that's more than we were expecting when we started this project. So anyway, uh, okay. I guess we'll move on. Thank you. I, would somebody say something? No. Thank you. No. Yes, thank you. Sorry, thank Madam President. You. Oh, okay. That was you, Steve. Okay. You're welcome, Steve. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Item number 12, Critical Service Center Administrative Building Update. That would be you, Brian. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, we continue to work with Renault Clark to establish space needs and positioning uh, as far as departments next to who and things like that within the new building, utilizing the questionnaires completed by both the board and staff. I want to thank board and staff for completing the questionnaires. I know I haven't received questionnaires from everyone uh, from the board perspective, but part of the next steps are going to be scheduling the site visit that we postponed because of COVID to East Valley Municipal Water District. At that tour, we'll talk about the questionnaire, talk about getting some feedback, additional feedback. I will be after this meeting asking asking Dory to send out another doodle poll. We're looking at the last week of October, the first week of November. If there's any conflicts of that right off the gate that you know of, let me know and we'll change that tentative two weeks span. But uh, yeah, we'll be sending out a doodle poll at that point and then we'll really start hitting it hard and heavy once we get your input from the East Valley building. That's my report. Okay, thank you. I look forward to that that field trip. And yeah, I'll have more to say on my questionnaire that I did not give you yet. <laughs> All good. Go on that, that trip. But good idea. I like that because I have some thoughts, but the questions. Anyway, okay. So uh, number 13, I'm pulling number 13 off the agenda. Uh, they will be replaced on for Monday with Mission Springs Water District's um, redistricting information. That's correct. And Misty Calder from my firm will be making a presentation uh, discussing the California Voter Rights Act, uh, our districting and our obligations to redistrict in light of the census data. Right. Yes. And, and I've asked uh, Desert Water Agency if they would uh, come on. Well, this they couldn't do it this month, so maybe they'll be able to do it next month in just a timeline of what their process is and um, but it, 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 it won't be something where we're, we're gonna be questioning or giving any questions, uh, answers or anything like that. So don't worry, Ashley, <laughs> I won't let them do that to you, but it would just be, um, it would just be for timelining and stuff. And I think what, what uh, 
Mr. Pinckney has in store for us on Monday um, about the process and about uh, the legalities of it would probably also apply to any water district, correct? Yes, and yes. we'll be going through the timeline and the deadlines. Uh, we have a deadline of April 17th to complete our redistricting and that would be applicable to both agencies, so. Okay, great, okay, thank you. So we'll do that on Monday. So now item number, oh, consent agenda. Anybody want to pull any one of these? Uh, it'd be 14, 15, or 16. Madam President, Russell Best wishes to comment on item 16. Oh, okay. So, okay. Now, my next question is do we have <laughs> any members of the public? <laughs> to, <laughs> and yes, we do. Okay. Um, Mr. Betts. Um, thank you. And I have a timer here. So I'm going to try and keep this to three minutes watching myself okay, on how that works I'll time, out. But... I'll time you too, Russ. Okay. Well, it's... <laughs> I started my clock early. Um, thank you. I, I understand what a tolling agreement is. You want more time to work out. You're maybe up against a deadline. I didn't see with the developer there at Skyborn. Um, my concern is there's a couple of wells out there that were supposed to have been delivered to the water district under an agreement that everybody signed, MSWD signed it, the developer signed it, and those wells were supposed to have been in years ago. Um, they put in two wells that weren't performing as they should be, probably still aren't. Um, and um, so now comes the agreement to, you know, because of some tough times or whatever reason, to allow that developer to extend the deadline. And and that happened by an agreement, the Mission Springs Water District agreed to extend the deadline. Now, by my way of thinking, if, if so I'm playing the uh, Mission Springs Water District and you guys are the developer, dang thing, hold on a second. And um, sorry, phone rang. So I'm Mission Springs Water District and you're the developer. Um, and you say, hey, I'd really like some more time. And I'm sitting there saying, you know, we really don't need any more wells. So, okay, no harm, no foul. You know, there's no, nobody's out, then we're fine. But conversely, if I'm a water district that needs wells, and the guy says, you know, we're really under hard times here. I would like to uh, put these off. And I say, you know, I'm sorry, but uh, you're obligated to provide these wells. And I'm going to have to go spend roughly $4 million to put in a well. And you should be putting that in. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I already froze, so I don't know what happened. Um, so, you know, so now you got a choice to make. Do you do uh, uh, you know a favor for a developer, or do you look out after the interest of the residents? Now, again, if no well is needed, no harm, no foul, great. You know, give the guy an extension, or give the company an extension. But if you do need a well, and you got somebody who's obligated to provide it by contract that everybody signed and shook their hands on. And then you got to go build a $4 million well. Well, now that the rate payers have suffered the burden of that well when they didn't have to, and that puts upward pressure on the rates. So, you know, now as you go into this tolling agreement, I want you to keep in mind that I understand there were some really tough times back in 2008. But we're not in those tough times now. Housing prices are up, housing is being built. We're no longer in those difficult, tough times. And I know this district needs wells, you just built one. So please, your paramount responsibility, your fiduciary duty is first and foremost to the rate payers. And when you go into these negotiations, this tolling agreement, I hope every director will keep them in mind. And my clock says three minutes. So thank you very much. You're just about three minutes on mine too. That was very good. Thank you. You had 14 seconds left actually. That's tough to okay. do, let me tell you. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, th thanks for that comment. And, and I, I agree with you. I, I think that we make sure that our rate payers are taken care of, and I'm sure that's what this is all about. So, okay, director's reports. Oh, I didn't ask if the rest of the board, did, did anybody have any of the other ones? Monday. Okay. Monday. Uh, is this item 16? Are you gonna give a report today or another day? No, it's on the consent agenda. Uh, no, there's no report. Uh, on it. It's all voted on. 14, 15, and 16 will be voted on at the same time on Monday. Oh, I thought there was a staff report. No, this is the consent agenda. Okay. Russia. All right, thank you. Okay, direct, uh, director's report. So upcoming events and director's reports. So Monday. Vice President Martin, Monday. Uh, did you have any this month, Director Sewell? Yeah, I can go today. Okay. I just have the one. Uh, September 10th, Greater Coachella Valley Chamber of Commerce all Valley mayors and tribal luncheon. 
Um, I thought it was overall a great event. Uh, the majority of the Valley's mayors were in attendance. Um, this is also their first uh, large event since they have their new CEO, um, Emily Falopino. Um, I thought she did very well and was pretty educated as far as the, the happenings in the Valley. And she's only been here, I think, about a month. Um, but I'm hopeful that uh, with her as a new CEO, that maybe the chamber will increase their presence here in Desert Hot Springs. Um, as far as specifics for the event, um, just about every city had uh, um, residential and commercial growth. Um, Scott Mattis did share that the 2020 census, um, Desert Hot Springs is now the fastest growing city in the Valley. And uh, one of his big points was to attend uh, the state of the city next week, that he has some additional exciting news. So I'm excited to see what he has to report. But overall, a great event. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Duncan, do you have any reports today or Monday? Yeah, I'll do the bulk of them Monday. I just wanted to uh, mention today, since we're talking about treatment plants and whatnot, uh, I learned from actually our former employee, Victoria Lort, during the CVWD board meeting Tuesday, Assembly Bill 818 has been signed and that restricts the flushable wipes. Uh, they will now by January 1st have a sticker on them that says, do not flush. So that's good news for our, uh, our guys down at the treatment plant. I know those are a problem. I don't know how big of a problem. <laughs> okay. I know those flushable wipes really mess up our, our system down there. And those are hopefully on their way out. And I'll, I'll do the rest Monday. Thank you. Uh, Director Grasha, do you have any? Oh, I didn't look. You probably, no, you don't. Never mind. Okay. I don't see any on the agenda. I don't have any either. I did the CBAG E&E &E meeting last month. And I just went to one this morning again. <laughs> anyway, okay. General manager's report. Um, I really don't have anything to add. I think uh, the staff did a good job of, um, of um, uh, saying everything that needs to be said. Um, I, you're gonna find out um, some things that also we're gonna, that uh, Marion is going to include in, in uh, her presentation today, but um, I'm going to let uh, Arturo speak to you uh, on the finance report. And actually, we're in the process of doing our audits, so there may not, you know, but we, but uh, Arturo did say that, that he would have a report ready for us, and I see he did. Hi, Madam President and members of the board. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, real quick, I will be going over the one uh, page summary that we have provided. Uh, normally, we do not provide this uh, simply because the audit is going on. And if we had any audit adjustments, they would reflect on these numbers prior to us submitting to the board. Um, we are confident that that's not going to be the case. We have not had an audit adjustment uh, in years. Uh, and so from here, you can see real quick, uh, there are uh, net operating income is at $4.2 million as of September 30th. And our expenses are, um, I'm sorry, the operating expenses, uh, that's the net operating income, which includes the $5.8 million of revenue and the 1.6 million of expenses. Uh, in addition, non-operating uh, revenue and expenses net was 767,000 uh, for a total of net income to the district of $5 million. Um, that is primarily, uh, our customers are paying their bills, uh, very few that did not, um, and in fact, the total amount we requested to the state for the arrearage program uh, amounted to $2.2 million, and that is the money that we will receive. Uh, there is some guidelines now as to how we're going to apply those payments to customers, um, and they're asking us to look a little bit deeper into some of the accounts. Uh, nothing major, but they are doing uh, their best to make sure that uh, those monies get allocated correctly. Uh, the, our current debt service ratio, which is very good, is at 7.4. Uh, investment income is lower, but it is still providing uh, some uh, good amounts of interest income and dividend income for the uh, year so far. Um, it is up to 200,000. That is not uh, taken out of here, but it is provided in the financials. The total uh, 
the unrestricted cash is at $6.1 million and restricted cash is at $31 million, which is basically a mirror of last year. Um, that is what we have with CalTrust, and that is the, the, what we're earning in interest and dividends. Um, and just a, a, a little bit of uh, background, attending the CSDA conference, I learned that CalPERS had a, a net increase in their investments of 21%. That is a very significant amount of money when you're talking about our uh, unfunded liability um, that they're going to spread out over 30 years. So that was very good uh, for this year that's also going to help the district. And I just wanted to share that information. Um, and I'll answer any questions at this time. I, I have one. Okay, go, okay, Director Grasha, go right ahead. Uh, I'm probably going to get called out of order, but I'll try. Can you uh, give me some kind of uh, indication what uh, will change when uh, once we start the debt service on the, uh, uh, what's the, What's that going to cost and, and every month to make those uh, payments? And, so, and uh, to answer your question, worst case scenario, the district would be paying on a monthly basis uh, $280,000. If we add that to the debt service ratio, our ratio will go down to 1.63. Uh, the SRF requirements for debt service ratio is 1.25. And they request that we commit to uh, funding a debt service reserve uh, within the first five years. They were, uh, they obviously know that we can do that. That is one of the reasons why they're issuing the, the first two grants. Okay. And, and, and that number, in, does, do, uh, here's where I get in trouble. Does that include the conveyance line or, because I, I, he had that in there and then it kind of wasn't in there when his, his, it, it's not part of the contract, but it was part of his estimation of costs. Is that part of your estimated expense? It is. That is, like I said, worst case scenario on the presentation was $48 million. That's after the already uh, guaranteed grants of $16 million. So yeah, that is included in those costs. And, and, and the guys that are gonna run the plant, what are their estimate? Uh, what are they estimating in, in additional uh, payroll costs and such that uh, might need to be added into that, or is that part of your estimation as well? Uh, we are working on that. And as you know, that was one of the biggest uh, con uh, concerns back when we were doing the uh, last rate increase. Well, those numbers were considered in the uh, rates uh, to, to spread out the cost of the new plant and those costs associated with maintaining it. So we know that all the cost is not going to fall on current customers, it's gonna be spread out to everyone that is still to connect with the plan. So those numbers have been uh, you know, vetted and we are very confident that we're gonna meet those through the rates that they, we uh, have in place. They were considered in that financial plan, in that financial prediction. Uh, I, okay, can you uh, have uh, your uh, guy that runs the uh, Horton plant that in charge over there at the meeting on Monday. I, I just have a couple, maybe have a couple of questions for him then that I probably can't ask now and call it a, a question on them. Um, can, well, I'll, I'll see what I can do to get your answers. Uh, I, I, I also wondered if he had uh, had a chance to chime in on the design of the uh, facilities that he would be. Uh, oh, really? Uh, of course he did. Well, <laughs> Jeez, come on, Steve. <laughs> and we've been doing this for a decade, Steve. I know, I know. And we have all, we've crossed all our T's. We've dotted all our I's. And, and, um, and, and, and now it's my turn. All right. That's well, why I'm we just telling you, we've said you this many times. This. You did all of this virtually outside of. Uh, That's not true. Well, we're, I, we're, I uh, we've done it all at meetings. Everything. And I haven't heard anybody uh, from our um, staff other than our general manager cheer this thing on. And I just want to make sure they're going to be happy with what they're getting too. I'm sure if they had their uh, uh, wishes uh, fulfilled that we'd see some difference uh, in uh, what we have at Horton. And I just want to make sure that what uh, they're getting over there is going to be what they would have in all of their dreams are answered. So I, I, I wish we would put in more attention over there than, than we're well, any question you might have um, for any staff, you have to go through Arden anyway, so you might as well ask Arden a question. 
Uh, not now, but I will, call him I will, up or something. I mean, he's on. He's I out of town right I now. I can't promise that we. I can't promise. Maybe he's on. I don't know what his schedule is, and and well, I know yeah, that yeah, Danny okay. might well be here, so I can't promise that I can do that. Yeah, no, I wasn't planning on doing that on Monday, but if he has a question for um, for Lee he, next week, he can call you and he you can get the answer for him. Yeah, yeah. I just want to know if he's going to be happy with what he's going to end up with. He knows more about this stuff than any of us. So, and he's been truly involved in all of I'm this. I'm sure he has, but I haven't seen that. So, well, if he gives his sign of approval, then uh, I'll be more happy with things. I haven't heard that yet. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, that's it. We're amazing. Arturo. That's all I can say. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions from Arturo? All right. Or Arturo. Okay. Thank you very much, Arturo. Good. Good report. Um, and now you have the, the premier, would that be the, the first, uh, and I'm expecting to be very impressed, uh, Marion is going, doing her first public outreach report, and uh, boy, we have a lot of good things to tell you, so, Marion? Thank you, General Manager Willem. Um, good afternoon, Madam President and members of the board. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight two upcoming activities our office is working on. First, we are currently launching a calendar drawing contest for all K through 12 students located within the district service area. Our team is promoting the contest through our local schools, social media, and in our fall customer newsletter. 12 winners will have their water conservation and groundwater protection illustrations showcased in a new 2022 district calendar, and will also receive an Amazon gift card for their efforts. The deadline for submission is November 15th and um, entry forms and additional information is located on our website at mswd.org forward slash drawing contest. Also, I'm very pleased to let you know that um, the, M the new MSWD website is anticipated to launch later this month. The user-friendly site is currently undergoing the final testing and review. And it's designed to be a one-stop shop for our customers and also our regional partners. Uh, the new site is mobile friendly and very easy to navigate. And it's going to be beautiful um, once you've got a chance to see it. Uh, thank you. And that concludes my update. Thank you. Uh, also, were we gonna show the video of um... The crews out there, Brian, did you say? Yes, I was going to take this opportunity. Thank you, General Manager. Uh, we had a unique situation yesterday that very rarely happens. Usually when we have a fire hydrant hit, it is during uh, the night and you can't get a feel for exactly what our crew, crews have to go through. Um, I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. Uh-oh, what happened to the video? <laughs> Up here, why is it not? Ryan, are you on the second screen? Pull it over to your main screen first. Uh, let's see here. I have one, I have two. It's, why is it not? Kurt, can you figure that out why it's there then, and, but it's not here now? Um, just click the share button right now. You have screen one selected, that should do it. Now open the video. Perfect. And then I have to then move it over. It's not. Can everyone see the uh, video? It's not a video. I see uh, the, the four squares and the, the light looks like the light shining on it. Light shining through a window. Is what oh, there you go. It's a window. All I see is the boardroom. <laughs> this is the wrong video. That's, yeah, they're trying again. They had the wrong video up. Well, maybe we will not show you. I was going to say, yes. Uh, I, I saw it briefly, but it went away. It went away. <laughs> it was there for like a two and a half seconds, and then, boop, and then it went to your old uh, video. Okay, of so now we can hear it. We just can't see it. So let me try to Hi, share then, this would you like me to share the oh, video? There it is. There it is. Well, we see it a little tiny. The, the, the... 
Okay, so this is what happened yesterday afternoon. Again, this is a fire hydrant that was hit here in town and our, our crews were uh, responding to it. What it does, because it's in the middle of the afternoon, you get some context of how tall the geyser is based on pressure and how much flow our folks have to deal with when they show up to these facilities. It's a very, not on, not on our, our screen. screen. Uh, if you go back to share screen, it did have it as an option. You just said screen one is correct. Yeah, so it's not on the screen now. Movie. Yeah. Share screen two, but move the video to screen two. Still not on. You're on it. I see it. Okay, so I we're not see seeing it. it. We're not seeing it in, in our room for whatever reason. Is it because we're pinned? It could be. Because we're, we're what? Pinned. We're pinned. No. Well, I think empty. I we'll see play it, play it for everybody else, I guess, and then Monday try to play it for us. <laughs> okay. Yes, you can see how tall the, the geyser is and what our folks yeah. are dealing with, and then even the uh, how much water you're looking at as it flows into both streets. That looked like about 80 feet. That's probably a very good estimation. And then we have it under control. Where was this? Uh, this is at Mission Lakes Boulevard and Vista Del Val. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, thank you to our staff for taking care of these things and getting the video and sharing it. Wow. It's it gives you it, it's a good it's a good now what happened? Uh, visual screen so anyway. that we understand how much we really can lose in a very short period of time through these fire hydrants. And this happens more often than you think. So, thank you, Brian. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Um, District Council comments. And we have, we have no closed sessions today. Okay. And currently not planned for Monday, but we'll, if anything comes up, then we'll. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, is that end your report? <laughs> and nothing else. Okay. Uh, director's comments? Yes, I have, I have one. Oh, congratulations to our general manager for putting in a very excellent Valley Voice article in the Desert Sun on water conservation. It was very well written and uh, very well done. Uh, yeah, I'll do thank it. you. The, 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 we all thank you. That was the staff effort. So thank you. Uh, Director Grasha. I don't have anything today. Thank you. Director Duncan. Uh, just wanted to real quick see if we can get an update one of these days on our smart meter uh, rollout where people can monitor their, their usage and everything on their cell phones. We can get it if we can get an update on that. All right. Not today, not today but sometime. All right. We are. We, we are, yeah, actually, you're going to see, like I said a little earlier, when it's sort of in conjunction with the pain near me, um, I, I'm really excited about a lot of the improvements that we're going to see. Now, some of them have taken a little longer. We were hoping to have them up, you know, several months back, but uh, we're working through issues that we can do to really make it even better. So, um but we are, we would, we're going to love to tell you this story. So thank you. We will. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Grasha, Director Duncan, did I ask everybody? Well, I, I just, just doing the math here real quick. That comes out to $100 million for that plan with the debt service, unless I did something wrong. So maybe he could go over that on Monday, if he can hear me. You can ask again on Monday. Okay, um, if he's not here, do it. I don't have any comments for today. We don't have any closed session for today. So if nothing else, I will meeting adjourned. All right.